Many do believe that the new seven-year program is a way to keep the children more occupied and to stop them from getting involved with their own company, eventually leading to crime. What can you say to those in Jamaica that are currently worried about crime? Is there a solution for Jamaica? Hmm. That's a great question. Are you a cricketer or a footballer? Both. Do you think you could give us your best impersonation of the Prime Minister? Jeez, please. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special Youth Month interview series. I'm Damon J. McCullough. Today we will be speaking with the opposition leader, Mark Golding. Let's go. Mr. Golding, thank you for agreeing to have a chat with us. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this, Damien J. It's a real pleasure to be with you. No problem. So first off, growing up, did you always want to be involved in politics? No, to be honest. I was always interested in politics from teenage years, really, not as a child, but as, as a teenager. But I had no aspiration to be involved in politics. I was just interested in it. And, uh, you know, I believed in the importance of trying to improve society and move Jamaica in particular forward. And I saw politics as an important vehicle for that. But I never saw myself at that time as becoming a politician. You know, I was really pursuing a professional um, career ultimately and then business as well. But as things worked out, you know, I, I got involved later on in my career. So is there anything or anyone that motivated you from going to business to politics? Michael Manley was somebody who I had interacted with quite a bit when I was a, a young attorney in the 90s because we were both involved in the ESOP program, that's the Employee Share Ownership Plan program, which was his brainchild and something he felt very passionately about. And I had bid on the tender to get the legal work um, as part of the law firm I was with at the time. So I ended up being involved in that program for several years and we had to have regular meetings about it. And we would discuss ESOPs and then we would move into discussing current affairs and philosophy and politics and so on. And you know, a lot of what he said at the time uh, resonated with me. And frankly, he encouraged me to get involved you know, uh, uh, in politics, but it was a long time after that that I decided to do it. Omar Davis as well, as a lawyer in the financial sector in the first decade of this century, the, there were a number of things that the sector was working on with the government, the withholding tax system, for example, that was a big one, the establishment of the Financial Services Commission as a regulatory body. I was a part of the task force that was looking at that. He asked me to join that task force. So I got to know him quite well. And eventually, I decided to, you know, after we sold DBNG and I achieved a certain kind of independence from that, then I decided to um, get more involved and I joined his constituency executive in South St. Andrew because I always loved the culture of Trenchtown and the inner city life and music and everything around that. So I was keen to get more closer to it, you know, closer to it. And then I was invited to become a senator by the most honorable Porsche Simpson Miller. At that time, you know, we had just lost the elections, but uh, she decided to appoint me as one of the opposition senators. And that was a big move for me. And I had the time to do it, so I decided to, to take it on. So it seems the constant encouraging has paid off, and now you're here in politics. And it's been a little over a year now since you've been the opposition leader. What would you say you like most about it? The daily challenges are really interesting. It's a, it's a completely different world to what I had experienced before. So I've had to be um, much more uh, savvy about communication, about imaging, about presenting myself to the public. I've had to be willing to step out much more into the public arena and engage with the, the media and so on. This has been something which um, you know, has been a process of learning for me and I'm enjoying that. And of course, trying to get the party uh, to c together and to do certain things within the party that will set it right for assuming government, because I'm confident we will assume government next, after the next general election. So getting ourselves ready for that is also a very interesting and challenging process, which I'm enjoying. So you do seem to enjoy the role that you have right now, but would you say there's anything you dislike about being the opposition leader? Well, sometimes the media... Um, <laughs> 
are not as friendly to as you would like. Sometimes they take positions which seem a little unbalanced and what have you. So, you know, you have to have a thick skin in my role and you won't always have things your way in terms of how you're presented. But that's all part of it. Um, obviously, within the party, we're going through a process of coming together. That has not always been easy, but I see um, significant um, improvement there. And so there have been times when I've had to deal with issues that were quite challenging over the past year. But overall, I'm pleased with where we are now, and I think we're making great strides. So you brought up the media, but the media doesn't always be the one to say the public. Do you think you ever get discouraged or demotivated by all their criticisms? Well, quite frankly, <laughs> no. Uh, I find that when I go on the ground, on the road and walk around, people are extremely receptive and warm towards me. And I'm always um, pleasantly surprised by that. And because, I, you know, these are not people who know me personally. So, you know, but I'm always willing to engage with them. And I do feel a certain affinity towards the people because as a, as a member of parliament in South St. Andrew, you know, I've had to build the trust and confidence of the people by engaging with them and being accessible to them. And now that I'm leader of the opposition and president of the party, I have less time for, you know, doing some of the things I used to do, but I'm still very committed to trying to be a good MP. So, you know, these the interaction with the public is something which I feel quite comfortable with. So since you brought up the public and all their criticisms and what they have to say, one of the biggest topics right now is the new seven-year program. What would you say to not only the young children, but their families that are worried about this new program? You're referring to the sixth form? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, <coughs> the problem with it is that I don't think that it has been well thought through. So to have everybody going into sixth form now, uh, is going to require significant resources to make that work. Uh, you know, the classrooms, the teachers to support it, and all the infrastructure around sixth form and the different pathways that have been identified. None of that is in place. And of course, the vast majority of school children in secondary school don't currently end up in sixth form. So to change that is a huge shift. And then the question is, how will the families afford it? because many families can't really take on the expense of sixth form, which is even more than secondary school below sixth form. So these things are real issues, which I don't think and they have been thought through adequately. And there really hasn't been sufficient consultation with the wider public, with the teachers and the principals, for one, and parents for two. You know, So I feel that the, this thing is um, being rushed a bit. And I, and I think the priorities are wrong, because right now we have many children who have been out of school for nearly two years, many of them have not had access to online learning. So I think the remedial education for those children, getting them back up the curve, um, fixing the learning loss that they have suffered, that should be the priority now. That's where the resources should be put. I don't think the sixth form program should be you know, on, the cor on the agenda for implementation next year. I think there's more important work to be done. Many do believe that the new seven-year program is a way to keep the children more occupied and to stop them from getting involved with their own company, eventually leading to crime. What can you say to those in Jamaica that are currently worried about crime? Is there a solution for Jamaica? Hmm. That's a great question. And I do think there needs to be a program for dealing with those youngsters who leave school and are not in either a tertiary course or an apprenticeship or at work, you know, who are there, who are idle and are um, on the street corners and obviously subject to temptation. So I think there needs to be a national program for them. I haven't really considered that the school system is the source of that program because I think those children need other things, you know, they need mentorship, they need life skills coaching, they need vocational skills training, they need to be prepared for the world of work and so on and sometimes remedial education. So yes, in terms of how Jamaica deals with the crime problem, I think that's an important aspect of it. Getting our children who, um, who have really been failed by the school system, getting them reoriented back to the path of being productive citizens rather than going into the path of badness or gunmanship. And right now there's a huge gap in our arrangements to support those youngsters. We need to invest in them because investing in them is an investment in our society. Apart from that, there are other measures I think that are really important. We have a thing called the Peace Management Initiative, which has really been allowed to um, suffer from a lack of resources. And we believe that it's a really important institution to help manage 
conflicts on the ground because it uh, involves community leaders or persons who are respected in the communities uh, being engaged, trained, and facilitated to get involved where there's a conflict and to try and ensure that it doesn't get out of control and spiral into reprisals and other things that often lead to many killings. So this is one of the programs that we think ought to be revived and really fully supported, uh, as well as the national youth program I was talking about to deal with those at -risk, risk youth who are really now inadequately serviced by the society. Well, not only has our crime changed and the new programs being instituted for school, a lot has changed from March 2020 to November now, 2021, as we're looking to head into 2022 in a couple of weeks. How do you, Mr. Golding, envision Jamaica after COVID? Obviously, we are going to be a much more digital society because we have had to adjust to communicating and working through digital formats uh, because of the restrictions that we've been complying with for nearly two years. And I think there's a lot of benefit to that in some respects, productivity gains that can be made, persons working from home efficiently, and spending less time commuting, less time on the road, uh, that saves some costs, that saves some environmental pollution. These are positive things. We need to uh, make the financial sector and the financial system a lot more inclusive because many of our people don't have access to it now. They, are, they, they, are, they don't have bank accounts and sometimes they're put off by the hurdles that are put in their way to become um, persons with bank accounts. And I know the financial sector is working to, to, to solve that problem and that needs to be encouraged. Going forward, I think we need to diversify our economy. I think food security is going to be increasingly an issue. Water resources are going to be increasingly an issue as we move forward in the era of climate change. Adjusting to climate change, I think, is going to be more and more a priority for Jamaica because adverse weather conditions are here and are going to just get worse. Sea levels will rise and so on. So we need to ensure that we invest in more resilient infrastructure to make sure that we don't have floods and roads being torn up by relatively um, normal um, weather events. And that's like what happened in St. James and Montego Bay a week or two ago. We need to um, really plan properly and put in the necessary drainage to support our roads networks so that we don't have losses of capital recurring because of poor planning and poor, poor implementation. So these are some of the things I think that will be the focus of the society. We want to really encourage agricultural production, support our small farmers, give them storage facilities, um, give them irrigation where they haven't got it, better farm roads, to enable the country to produce more food to feed itself, save foreign exchange in that way, and become a, a supplier of food to many islands in the region that do not have the wherewithal. So we've talked a lot about your vision, your future, and what is going on now. But as said earlier, it's been a little over a year since you've been opposition leader. What would you say, Mr. Golding, has been your biggest accomplishment so far? I think we have done well in bringing the party from, um, from a process of several internal elections which had um, left the party with new um, issues that needed to be resolved. We formed a unity committee and we went through a process of healing there. It was a bumpy road to some extent, but I think we've achieved a great deal from that. And I believe the party is a much more cohesive political force now than it was when I started as leader. I think we've established um, the OT Fairclough Trust Fund for our party workers, building a new institution to support our party workers who need that kind of help, whether it be housing or education or small business. And that's a new institution which I know is going to serve the party well going into the future. Those are two of the things that I think we've achieved. And then as a per in, on a personal level, I think I'm starting to um, be uh, seen more uh, in the public domain and people I think are starting to recognize what I bring to the table as somebody who is a very experienced professional. I was a leading corporate lawyer for many years in Jamaica, a very successful business person as well. So I've achieved quite a bit outside of politics. I didn't come in politics to make money or to take from the people. I've really come in politics to try and give back to my country that I have benefited so much from. And I think people are realizing that I do have something to offer and I look forward to showing them that I do. We, you brought up your personal space. Let's step out of the business zone for a little bit. Let's learn a little bit more about you. So, Mr. Golding, 
if you were to have one special playlist and it could feature either Peter Tosh or Bo Bob Marley, who would you choose? Between the two? Yes. Wow, that's a tough one. I love them both deeply, you know. But I'd have to go for the Whalers, to be really honest, which had all hit them plus Bonnie and go back into some of the, the classic tracks that really were the source of much of what reggae music became afterwards. And of course, the, the, the Whalers formed in Trenchtown, which is in my constituency, and that is part of the Trenchtown sound and the Trenchtown heritage. So I'd have to go for some of the great Whalers tracks. Okay, so we've heard about some male musicians, but let's look on the female side. Mm -hmm. Who would you prefer, Rihanna or Nicki Minaj? Wow. Well, I, I'm a Rihanna fan, you know, as a Caribbean girl. Well, they both have Caribbean roots, but I think I, uh, Rihanna is somebody whose sound I really like and um, look I, you know, I like as well. So, yeah, I would choose Rihanna. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've heard your music taste. We have that established. Mm -hmm. But what about sports? Are you a cricketer or a footballer? Both. I, you know, I played cricket um, for my school. Uh, in fact, I played sunlight cricket in, in second form, um, bowling left arm orthodox. And then football is something that I've always played. I played to the, the prep school that we both went to, Mona Prep. I was on the team there for two years. And I've con played football right through my adult life until fairly recently when, you know, I felt it was a little risky to take. Um, keep going with the possibility of the young ball and them giving me some wicked tackle and all that and getting injured. So I no longer play that, but um, I love football and I love cricket. Of course, cricket has been a bit disappointing in recent years because the West Indies has been so up and down and difficult to follow as a fan because they, they let us down too often. But we still love them and we hope that they'll achieve some consistency moving forward. And of course, football. Well, I love the Premier League football. I love the, um, you know, the Serie A and... and um, the, the better European clubs, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, you know, um, Real Madrid, um, Paris Saint-Germain, PSG. Yeah, and it, in the Premier League football, I'm a Man United fan from a long, long, long time. But I love other clubs too. I'm not a tribalist when it comes to football. Okay, mm -hmm. so music, sports. What about your acting skills? Do you think you could give us your best impersonation of the Prime Minister? Jeez, and peace. Um... <laughs> You really caught me um, with that one. I've never attempted to um, impersonate the Prime Minister. And I don't think I want to give that a shot on, on, on um, live TV or on recorded TV for that matter. I'd have to practice that a bit. But, um, you know, I watch the Prime Minister quite a bit as he speaks and so on. And he's, you know, he's been well coached as a public speaker. I can see that he has benefited from that. And, you know, I, I'm in a learning mode too. So, you know, I don't mind. Um, learning from him and I'm sure he has things he can learn from me. As we bring up the title of the Prime Minister, Mr. Golding, if you were to become the next Prime Minister after the next general election, what changes could young people like me look forward to? Damien G, that's a great question. I think young people in Jamaica want to have a sense of hope. And one of the biggest challenges to Jamaica going forward is the deep inequality in our society which feeds into the social dysfunctionality that we see in terms of how young people are brought up and how they manifest it in terms of negative behaviors and ultimately the violent crime problem that saps our will, undermines our economic prospects and so on. We believe that uh, building a more fair and just society in a deliberate way is important to improve the prospects for our young people. And that means investing in those young people who Currently, the system has failed to give them a second chance to re reorient them away from dysfunctional behavior and from badness and the gun into productive citizenship. And we believe that that's an investment that will pay significant dividends for the society as a whole. In terms of uh, other youngsters who are on the right path, we can look to us investing more in technology, more in building the, 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 the internet backbone for all Jamaican families that is needed. The government, I think, has been moving far too slow in this. I think we, we were the ones who brought electricity in the 70s so the, in, most Jamaican families have access through the rural electri electrification program. We want to do something similar to ensure everybody has broadband access because that ultimately creates a huge vista of opportunities for people, both in commerce and in learning and in other areas. An interesting plan and vision, Mr. Golding. But let's say you were to lose the next election. Would you remain in politics? Hmm. I don't know. I'm not thinking along those lines, to be really honest. Um, 
you know, I'm not in this to lose, so you know, I, I haven't really f thought about what would happen in that eventuality. I mean, I expect to win it, and I'm working towards that. With all this vision and your plan, it must have had some inspiration. So, Mr. Golden, if you could have one conversation with anyone in the world, dead or alive, who would it be? Wow, that's a great question. A conversation with anyone, dead or alive. I think I'd like to speak to Nelson Mandela. I think, uh, you know, that's an off-the-cuff answer, but you see I have a picture of him right there with Michael Manley, and the truth is that he is an inspirational human being because he came through such adversity, such oppression, both collective and personal to him, having spent much of his life as an adult in prison, an immensely talented and brilliant man who had strength of character to bring forgiveness and a more um, loving approach to rebuilding that society and I think the world as a whole regards him as an icon and I would love to have an opportunity to talk with him. Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. an interesting choice. Well Mr. Golding, mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot of talking here. Let's put your practical skills to the test. I have a little math question for you mm -hmm. and you have around five seconds to answer. Okay. So pen and paper ready? I believe they've given me one here, yep. Thank you. What is six multiplied by seven? Divided by 42 times 1. Wow, I have no idea. Well, 6 sevens are 42. Divided by 42 is 1. Times 1 is 1. So Time, what's your answer? 1, my answer, the answer is 1. And that is correct. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have, Mr. Golding. I'm Thank you for having this chat with us. Well, it's really been a very interesting interview, um, Dami J. And I want to thank you for the thought that you put into those questions. I must uh, confess, some of them uh, were challenging, especially the impersonation question. I didn't want, there were some things I could have done, but maybe they would have been inappropriate. So I thought I would dodge that one. But overall, it's been a very good experience for me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have talked to you. Congratulations. Keep it up. Thank you, Mr. Golding. All right. That's all the time we have for this special Youth Month interview series. I'm Damon J. McCullough. Thanks for watching. <laughs>